I would just right uh hello everyone and, and welcome um can i just check if uh participants on the zoom can hear us okay yep it's great thank you uh uh thank you and welcome everyone to i think this is the last Maurice Block lecture of, of the season. Uh, we're very fortunate uh, to have with us today, uh, Professor Peter Dallalasen, who has come all the way from uh, Denmark. Um, Professor uh, Peter Dallalasen is a political scientist at the University of Copenhagen. Uh, he's a part uh, president of the European Evaluation Society. Uh, he's an internationally recognized uh, thinker and practitioner of evaluation science and, and practice. Um, and uh, you, you can tell a lot about his unique approach to, to, to thinking about uh, evaluation from the title of his books. Uh, so, for example, his most uh, recent uh, publication is enti entitled uh, Casualties of Causality. This was published last year. Uh, and prior to that, uh, he wrote a book uh, entitled Quality from Plato to Performance. Uh, but he is perhaps most well known for his uh, 2012 book, The Evaluation Society, uh, where he warned us about the rise of evaluation machines, uh, which are basically uh, processes and mechanisms and practices of evaluation with ever decreasing human uh, input and judgment. Um, so we're very lucky to have uh, him visit us today and to talk about whether we can in fact change evaluation systems. Um, I'm really looking forward to this talk. And please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Peter Dahl. Thank you very much. Thanks for the kind words, man. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks to you and also to Audrey for organizing everything so, so smoothly, smoothly behind the scenes. And uh, thanks to you for coming. I know you have plenty of other interesting options in the wonderful Scottish weather that you could have enjoyed uh, rather than sit in on my presentation. The title of my presentation is, in fact, a simple question on change evaluation systems. But it is my hope that it, I will convey that it is a bit more complex than just a simple question. Let me unpack it a little bit. Why evaluation systems? Because I believe that during the last couple of years in a couple of decades, we have seen an increasing institutionalization, extending evaluation systematically across time and place. We have seen evaluation cultures, mainstreaming evaluation, etc. And it is an underlying assumption in my talk that evaluation systems are epistemically, philosophically, sociologically, politically fundamentally different from just doing evaluations one after one. Why is it necessary to discuss whether we can change them? Because once we institutionalize things, they run the risk of becoming Frankenstein's monsters. Frankenstein is also a human construct, but he has the logic of his own once he's constructed. And it is actually, in fact, I will argue, not easy to unscramble the eggs once that we have created evaluation systems. So therefore, the question, can we change them? There is also another little funny, meaningful word in my, my question, which is the term we. So there is an underlying assumption in my question that there is a sense, despite of the fragmentation and individualization and politicization that we see in our modern societies, that it is meaningful to ask whether we, as a society, collectively, together, use evaluation systems in some way, uh, in a way that serves a collective imagination that we can create a better society. The reason why I pose this as a question is that we can imagine that in this room, there would be some users of the information of evaluation. Here would be some architects and evaluation systems. Here would be some clients and consumers of public services. Here would be members of the city council. Here would be members of local communities who have different kinds of interests. 
he would be corporate leaders in different kinds of organizations, and he would be psychometricians and statisticians and evaluation specialists, and we cannot say for granted that all these different charismatics and roles have anything in common. To have anything in common, it would be needed to discover uh, something that John Dewey, American pragmatist and philosopher, has called that we discover society together, that we find out we actually have something in common, that, that the different destinies we have as individuals in society, in a way, reflect some sort of collective identity or destiny or something. Like that. So, can we change evaluation systems? Is, I hope, not a trivial question. I will unpack my answer to this question in terms of three different parts of my presentation. First, I will talk a little bit about the institutionalization of the shift. Then I will talk about the problems created by evaluation systems as I see them. And finally, I will move or maybe even jump from theoretical speculations to a quite empirical and very practical case of deliberation or, if you will, participation into the discussion of a large evaluation system, in my case, national testing schools in Denmark. And if I do my presentation well, and if I succeed in allowing you to understand where I'm heading, part three of my presentation is an integrated part. It is intended to illustrate the complications that we have if we collectively sit together and try to change an evaluation system. If you're not interested in national tests, I do hope that you will survive part three of my presentation, regardless of the substantive matter of the case, because that's not important. I'm thinking of the national tests as an evaluation system, and I try to explore all the complications of trying to change that politically. Right. Friday, we had the last meeting in the expert group that I was heading talking about this deliberation about national assistance schools, and we are delivering our report to the Minister of Education on the 4th of August, so I am not completely done in my own brain. We're thinking through the implications of what we're about, but I will share my experiences with you to the rest of my group. So that's the plan. First, institutionalization of evaluation. What do we mean by that? Evaluation systems are large scale. They extend in time and place. They have durability. They extend across counties, communities, and across nations. Think of OECD PISA. Think of measurements of the SDGs. Think of national test systems. Think of accreditation systems, auditing systems, performance management systems, quality assurance systems. I count all of these kinds of the practices as examples of evaluations and the evaluation systems to the extent that they carry out and perform and constitute evaluative work in their environment. They are also characterized by infrastructure. They are supported by manuals, indicators, digital networks, computers, uh, uh, testing machines, etc. And these infrastructures, be they social and, and or technological, um, play a key, if not a decisive role in, in, in formatting evaluation systems. They make possible the existence of large-scale evaluation systems. I would also argue that to some extent in the recent years, there has been what we could call a decoupling from the liberty, meaning if we read textbooks in social science and in metrology, not metrology, not the thing about the weather, but metrology, the, the science on metric, right? If we read textbooks in these things, we learn that first we define the concept clearly, then we find operational indicators, operationalizations of that concept, and the degree to which we do that correctly is an issue of validity. And then after that comes reliability, whether we can measure that consistently across time and place using different instruments and different people. But validity means that we assure that we know, so to speak, before we start measuring, we know what we are measuring. And most of my colleagues who are quantitative specialists would say the rules of the game are first you define, then you measure. 
Unlikely, however, that what we have seen in recent evaluation systems is a sort of departure from that. We measure things in a way when we're not entirely sure what is measured. One example is tests that are meant to measure the, the accomplishment of very specific skills of very specific students, very specific yes, very specific disciplines, courses taught in school. And then some take that as a measure of school quality, which nobody knows who, what actually is, but they take that measure as an expression of school quality. Among the scholars and patients, there is no human being that I know that knows exactly how school, how good the scholars and patients are patient. But we can measure with very high degree of precision the number of Google Scholar citations, me and you and you and you. But we don't know the definition of Google Scholar citations uses of a citation because that's hit somewhere in an algorithm. Because if we knew it, we could start cheating and create artificial citations. And then somebody uses Google Scholar citations as a measure of reputation, as a measure of status, as a measure of quality, as a measure of all kinds of things. So it seems like there is some that the relation between the concept and its measurement has somehow been turned upside down so that we have a measure and then when it's used we reinterpret what it might mean and we can also disagree about that so it could also be redefined in a new context what it means which is sometimes known as mission grid that we measure things and then later on it becomes it, it means something else but it's used for different managerial political or practical purposes so these are some of the characteristics of evaluation machines. Notice how point number three is dependent on point number two and point number one. Gotcha. Let me just very, very briefly place what I'm saying into a brief sketch of what we could call the history of evaluation. One periodization made by Lawrence Hogan is that Originally, we had something we call social science, and then from the early 60s, maybe 58, we started thinking of evaluation as apply social science to actually contemporary programs and stuff. And we started thinking of evaluation as a specific field there, but at the, in the beginning, it practically meant the practical application of social science methods. Read, um, Rossi Lipson, uh, Rossi uh, Freeman, these kinds of things, they would say that. Uh, later on, uh, the professionalization of evaluation, defining it as a distinct field with the theories and ideas of application and usefulness and all these kinds of things. And from May 3 onwards, we have the expansion and institutionalization and the, also the coalition between institutionalization and evaluation and bureaucratization and the alliance between some versions of evaluation and new public management in terms of indicators, et cetera, et cetera. I would also argue that from 2020 onwards, we have something we could call the skeptical turn in evaluation, a branch, a little niche of literatures that looks more skeptic, more skeptically at evaluation. Why is that important? It is, I would argue, trying to reflect on my own perspective because I identify myself with this position. It is not just that there are a few critics who shout and scream. The idea is that they are able to see things in evaluation that we haven't seen before because evaluation reveals some of its darker sides more clearly because it is repetitive and it's too shallow. So instead of saying, no, you know, one, one evaluation that didn't go too well, when we institutionalize it, we could also imagine that we can more clearly see its downsides because it is repeated in large game systems regularly. So for that very reason in itself, the institutionalization of the diagnosis could also produce the critical look that makes a look at the same phenomenon possible historically. That's my that's the account of my own perspective. Why is this a problem? because the evaluation systems tend to create some controversies, problems, et cetera. Here is a reduced little list of perhaps the most important ones. Constitutive effects mean the way that reality is produced 
by actors related to evaluation systems in the light of their knowledge of being evaluated. So they respond and react to the fact that they know that they are under evaluation and sometimes create new realities out of that awareness. Teaching to the test in schools is one simple example. Here is a little conceptual table of things you can look at if you're interested in constitutive effects. You can, for instance, look at the content of work in schools. Some teachers may prioritize that particular concept, which they know is later being tested. It can affect the timing of things. So we know that by the end of third grade, certain things need to be tested, uh, uh, taught because we know they're tested by the end of the third grade. It is like budget and accounts, which, which also have a sort of timely logic structure in them. This also evidently affects social relations. The awareness when I teach that my students will fill in something that looks like consumer satisfaction questionnaire after the end of the course affects the, uh, um, the likelihood that I will introduce my students to very risky and unknown. Uh, activities in teaching, which I'm not going to do because they will evaluate me on the basis of how clearly I tell them how easily they can accomplish the goals set up for my teaching activities. For example, um, we could also imagine that constitutive effects in a larger perspective affect the world views of people involved. For instance, thinking of scientific activity as production because we measure the product rather than the scientific activity as an accomplishment in itself. We share articles and citations and books and stuff. I like the term constitutive effects not because it's very precise, but because it's a sort of, it opens the doors to different kinds of inquiries, like a sensitizing concept, uh, uh, motivating us to be curious about many different things that happen when we are uh, Considerative effects do not only build on particular evaluation criteria, could also build on particular methods. In my country, for instance, we have quite a debate recently about the so-called evidence movement in social. Now, the evidence movement claims that policies are better when they are, when they are backed up by RCTs. Very sympathetic, um, in many ways, a useful viewpoint. However, in social work, the closer you get to how the citizen lives in his or her normal conditions, in a house, in a family, in a local community, the more difficult it is to create total control over the experimental conditions that are a necessary requirement for randomized control trials. So by definition, those who work closer to citizens rather than those who work in the hospitals and under more controlled situations, have a relative disadvantage in terms of providing the kind of evidence that is accepted by the evidence. Furthermore, if you compare the amount of trauma, millions of trauma that you invest, for instance, in medicine in a country like Denmark, as compared to the amount of trauma you invest in early childhood research, then of course, preventive activities in public health are disadvantaged as compared to the interventions related to medicine, simply because more money is invested in what in RPTs and medicine rather than in prevention of work in other challenges. So there's a constitutive effect in the large scale system depending on the design and mentality inherent in evaluation systems. Okay, so that's one point. Another problem has to do with a simple thing as costs. Costs of evaluation systems do not only include the fees that are paid to consultants, but also the time spent on evaluation by professionals, even if their time devoted to evaluation is not counted because it's considered part of professional activity in general. It also includes attention, because as Herbert Simon says, one of the most precious and scarce resources in modern organizations may not necessarily be money, but be attention. So if we steal professionals' attention because they devote that attention to evaluation, they may have less attention to other parts of their professional activities, which may sometimes be invisible cost because it's not monetized. But let's carry out the argument about costs. 
if we do evaluability assessment, which is a procedure to determine not only whether evaluation is possible, but also whether it's useful in a particular case, you could imagine that you have some projects here where there is a high likelihood that the evaluation will be useful if you carry it out. It is feasible and possible. Two things. If you go in this direction, you could imagine that there would be projects that benefit relatively less. And over here, you would have some that benefit almost nothing because either have you will terminate the project anyway, or uh, you already know how it works. You don't need additional information. The same could be children in the classroom. This person will benefit a lot from the test because the test will produce things that are not known about less than before. And then that person over here in the school will not benefit from the test. For instance, if the test says you're very good at German, continue next year with working in German with both oral and written German. But hello, there is no other way to work with German than oral plus written German. These two things together sort of constitute working with German, right? So there is no new information for that person on the test, which a clever and precise evaluability assessment would reveal before we intervene with an evaluation. So in a good classical thinking, do evaluation over here. Don't do it over here. Now, then comes the cost. Let's just assume for the sake of the argument that it costs the same to produce evaluation, to produce highly evaluable projects, and also to these lists. This is not realistic, but for the sake of the argument. If these are the costs, and these are the benefits on scales that I don't define, but simply suggest uh, as something we can imagine, then we would have here something we could call evaluation debt weight, which simply means that we spend too much energy on evaluation as compared to the, to the benefits of it. This doesn't mean that, that evaluation is not useful. It's entirely useful over here. It's also a little bit useful here, but not compared to our costs. This evaluation debt weight is something that we do not talk about when we design evaluation systems at the moment, at least not enough. Evaluation systems can also be difficult to change. I suggested that in the early part of my presentation. There is a distance in time and place between those who design the evaluation system, the then architect, so to speak, the people under evaluation we call evaluators, the potential users, be they citizens, politicians, consumers, etc. And my argument is that with institutionalization of evaluation systems, we increase the social distances between the people involved. One example is, for instance, when we did PISA. Uh, in Denmark, I asked a representative from OECD whether they would have an open office in Denmark, let's say Wednesdays from one o'clock to three o'clock, so that Danish citizens and teachers could go in and contact OECD and ask them questions about the Danish peace act. And they never thought of that idea. And their teachers in Denmark have no clue whether the peace act is produced by OECD and they don't know where OECD office is. So they have no idea of whom to contact if they're not happy. There is a democratic rupture here that there is no connection between people under evaluation and who design. Furthermore, so there is a lack of feedback about the unintended effects of suspicions, but also the very term unintended effect, which is very fairly popular in the literature, is in a way sort of not really revealing what the problem is. When an architect with evaluation says, oh, yes, I know there is an unintended effect, there may be a little bit teaching to the test, but I can really assure you that it's clearly unintended. We never really intended to produce these effects. Then it has the effect that Sigmund Bauman calls adiaphorization, meaning it has no moral meaning. Because it was really unintended. We never meant that to happen. I would argue that it is a real effect. It is a social political effect. It is a practical effect. I don't care whether it's intended or not. It's a real effect. But by claiming it to be unintended, you can take out the moral and political value of it. I would rather have that we discuss the constitutive effects as constitutive rather than as unintended. So not only is there a lack of connection between people who design the evaluation system and those who experience them, there is also a vocabulary that reduces the meaningfulness of discussing the feedback. Ah, it's just unintended. Great. 
point of my view, constitute serious democratic challenges to the extent that we think that some of these constitutive effects and costs are actually substantial in modern society. I'm here inspired a little bit by a French uh, philosopher and political scientist from the North, who talks about democracy as something that is constantly developed over time. So there is not one fixed definition of democracy. It changes with, with time. It changes over time who we think are, relative, are, are legitimate participants in democratic processes. Eve, every new epoch makes its own experiences with democracy. So if we apply for some of thinking, I would argue that an important democratic challenge today is how to democratize the discussion about large-scale evaluation systems. This is something that we don't have a long set of historical experiences with because we haven't got a long set of experiences with large scale evaluation systems. So, this is an important contemporary democratic challenge. End of part two of, of my presentation. Here comes part three. I consider part three a case of deliberation, a case of inviting different stakeholders into a structured discussion about how to improve a large scale evaluation system. Why would we want to deliberate? Why would we want to invite a broad set of stakeholders to participate in this? Perhaps because it would then be possible to broaden the variety of participating stakeholders so we don't only listen to psychometricians or statistical specialists or pedagogical experts, but we also listen to teachers and students and parents and school principals and municipal leaders of school systems, etc. We could also argue that we would curb the influence of only the experts by doing so. And we could argue that it would also be really, really important how we did that, because our deliberative theory talks about the extreme importance of how that process might be designed then. Okay. We would do that because if we wouldn't only get a broader set of inputs and feedback, which I mean would logically do by inviting more stakeholders, we could also assume or imagine it would lead to a better decision. I would Put a question mark though, because we don't know that by definition, just by inviting more people that we get a better decision. But it's a potential, we could do it. It is also possible that stakeholders would perceive of that process as more legitimate, and the new design of an evaluation system should be more legitimate once they have participated in the discussion. But then again, this is not something we can guarantee. It may happen that people feel invited, but they also feel that they didn't have a voice or they didn't have the expertise or that. The outcome was something that was not, they were not happy. It's positive. All we know is that we get a broad set of inputs and feedback. But let's see, let's, cons let's consider a specific case. We're now going to Denmark, a country of 5.8 million people in terms of size roughly comparable to Scotland. Mm -hmm. We have 16 plus parties in Denmark. I give you this fact because no political decision will be made without support from a plurality of political parties. There is no single party who can make any political decision. Okay. So we need to have people who think in different ways on board on whatever we decide. Finally, um, this last slide says, I do apologize for this little expertise. Municipalities are important because they're the owners of schools in Denmark. So you cannot really implement new things without municipalities at the local level because they own public schools. That's enough of the context you need to know. Okay. The case is about national tests in Denmark. They were introduced in 2004 by an OECD panel that visited Denmark. The OECD panel spent one hour and 45 minutes, making an in-depth analysis of the famous criticism. And they concluded this afternoon's inquiry by saying all that is needed in Denmark 
if you want one single change that would most make the most of the difference, it would be an evaluation culture is new. Here you see the link between the term evaluation and the following testing system being in. So we cannot just say as evaluators, oh, that is that something completely different, entirely different for week. No, no, no. It was introduced in the name of an evaluation culture. In 2006, there was a political decision to, uh, to introduce national tests. In 2010, there was a full introduction of 10 mandatory tests for, for each pupil during the school career. I wouldn't know anything. An adaptive test principle was uh, that when right. you take yeah. the test, I didn't know to whom to write. So, we are still not uh, finding how well books 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 these days. Box. Um, there's one box missing out of all, and there's nothing downstairs left. Depending on the proficiency, absolutely the same. This box mm -hmm. is here. Okay. Each test takes 45 minutes. There is no publication of the results, so we don't make a public ranking list. And then all the teachers and school principals will know the results of what in the parliamentary chain of control, but not journalists and not the public to prevent a public shaming of schools. There were several school reforms then. In 2013, there was an intense conflict between labor and management in schools. And in 2018, it was decided to evaluate the tests based on an intense discussion of the quality and meaningfulness of the tests. You may not know Danish, but you know enough to know what the expert <laughs> dump the national test. You can figure that out. It's not complicated. Uh, there is also one emphasis drop the national test, they don't work. Um, this was the kind of tone of the front page of the leading national newspaper. So there was quite an intense debate. These are some of the findings from an evaluation that followed in 2018. This is the blue ones are uh, upper level administration whether they think that the test helped create a political focus on results, or whether they facilitate monitoring, and whether action plans are made as a result of the findings. The, the purple ones here are school principles, whether they whether tests help them observe uh, targets and make action plans. The last gray ones here are teachers' survey responses. Use, whether the tests are use, useful for teaching is this tiny <laughs> little result here, whether they prioritize test content and whether they ignore material not tested. So if you look at this, it is a steep hill going downwards. The closer you get to the classroom, the less happy are people about the tests, roughly speaking. So something had to be done. Qualitative data ask them, what are the problems that teachers have with the test? Test items are not relevant, do not capture cost of the matter, it takes too long time to understand the feedback from the test that teachers are given so that the uh, transformation of test results into new pedagogical practices is impeded by. And also the public debate that I showed you on the front page undermines the credibility of tests. So when teachers went up to the school principals, say we can't use these things because they, they are not reliable and they're not valid, and we can read that in the newspapers. And what do we do? And the school principal would have to say, I don't know, because I also don't understand. There was also a finding saying that most of the other tests in the schools are really linear, not, not adaptive. And many of the tests used in other countries are also linear, not adaptive. Adaptive tests are those that where each child gets his or her own combination of test items, depending on how well they answered the previous grade. A linear test means that once you're on this way well track, you will just answer all these questions, these items in the test, regardless of your proficiency in the previous items. I will get back to pros and cons of each of them in a little while. But these are the, these are the differences. Okay. Here comes deliberation then, because the ministry composed 
a group of different stakeholders, including professors, a municipal head of education, a school principal, teachers, a pupil, a parent, a school development consultant, and some test professionals to discuss um, 18 people altogether to discuss what to do with the evaluation and the public debate of the tests and how to propose a new national testing system. So here we have the liberation. This is not all of the danger population. It's not representative of the population, but it does comprise a broad variety of relevant stakeholders. Mm -hmm. So there comes the deliberation. I happen to be chairperson of that committee. So that's how I got my first hand insights, however biased they might be, into that process and the results. And that, that is why I shared with you as a result of the as a as we're related to the question whether we can change, in fact, evaluation systems. In my analysis, I very well learned that there was a risk that this would be dominated by experts. Professors are more likely to talk. They are more likely to talk for a long time, as you know. They're also more likely to use complex language, and they're also more likely to dominate other people in the room if there is no other intervention during deliberation. There was also a strong focus on technical issues, as I see it, because psychometricians and statisticians like to talk about technicalities, which also reduces the likelihood that normal teachers in the group, in the group would just give their views simply because they didn't know the technical. It is crucial, however, that when we discuss evaluation systems, that we do not allow only the technician to go out and protect them, because, as you all know, even if you haven't read, read Homo Latour, you will know that the technical issues and social issues are tightly, tightly intertwined. So if we first decide, okay, the technicians will talk about the technicalities, then we have already lost the battle in terms of the broad deliberation. We need to find ways to talk about that in another way. There were also very strong differences of, of opinion. And I was afraid as a chairperson in this in the group that the road toward consensus was in fact really blocked. This is why I proposed the following structure of the argumentation. I proposed that not only the expert, but every member of the group could make a recommendation. Let's call it recommendation X. All could insert a recommendation. They could also, all members of the group could insert an argument in favor to, of support of recommendation X, argument to support, the third argument to support recommendation X, and they could also produce argument not to support this recommendation, one, two, three. And nobody could stop other members from doing so. My idea was simply to not allow any expert in the group to monopolize the, the debate. For example, by, let me call it English, Philip Ostring, that you talk so long that people get tired and people will withdraw from the debate because someone talks. So that was the structure that I proposed in the report to make sure that more voices were heard. Here is an example. We discussed the adaptive tests. Some argue that they would be more precise because you would adjust the proficient, the difficulty of the item to the level of the student. And you would all the time ask more and more each person about this one, more each one, until you narrow down the statistical bandwidth in which the proficiency of the individual student. And they would argue that it would lead to better pedagogical use. However, with a sort of black box or blue box in between, because I can't figure out how exactly it is that precision leads to pedagogical use in isolation. There were also advocates of the linear tests after making critical discussions about all of these things. Then the linear tests said they are more useful for teachers because when you have 25 students in the class and 40 test items, the teacher has to analyze 40 items if you do linear tests because those students have the same test and the students can help each other talk about the, how they answer the test items. Whereas if you have that test, there are a thousand test items in the class, and you don't know which of students have answered which of the test items unless you check all ten, all excuse me, all thousand cells in this spreadsheet. 
So we argue that you would help teachers if you had linear tests because they would be able to understand what was tested more clearly. So here's the link between the technical issue and the practical issue. And you would also renew sources of error in the underlying algorithms in the selection of test items. And you would produce a higher degree of democratic control of the quality of test items because everybody would be able to see the whole test because they were based on the linear test. So all kids would get the same test items, which also allows democratic control. So here again, a link between the technical issues and the issues of legitimacy, transparency, etc. We had an intense discussion of all of this. We ended up with 54 recommendations, which made people laugh because you cannot make 54 recommendations to the minister. We did that. 33 of them were something that we agreed upon. We even agreed that we would recommend the linear not adaptive test principle. And we also suggested that they take place early in the, in the school year, not late, so that they could be used formally for the rest of the school year, rather than summatively at the end of the school year, and a number of other things. A majority of members supported 17 recommendations and four recommendations were supported only by minority. In this way, we represented diverse viewpoints and did not impose too much of a consensus structure on the whole, on our whole report, allowing more voices to be heard. That was the intention. Here is your very humble and not very happy presenter in front of the Danish parliament, working like a horse with a national conference, being in newspapers and writing notes and memos and having meetings with the Minister of Education, the Parliamentary Committee on Education, the majority of parties, spokespersons for parties and the national minimum of policies. And I thought the work was ended by when we produced the report, but that was really where the work began. Creating what is today called in the university system so-called impact, discussing with a lot of folks a lot of things so that they would understand the background for what we did and what was in the report. In on May 5th, 2021, the Union of Teachers and the National Union of Municipalities got together and made recommendations saying we want linear and adaptive tests, we want tests early in the school year, and more, which resonated very, very well with the content of the most important issues in our report. And in October 21, a majority in parliament adopted a revised policy on national tests, saying we want linear tests, not adaptive tests, we just want tests early in, in the school year. Now, if you're very critical, you would say that that is just a minor adjustment. If you are less critical, you would say it's an important adjustment. If you are left-wing radical, you would say that we are in the pocket of new public management, uh, uh, the tyrants, and we're just revising small little details. So depending on your position, you will say that this is an important revision or it's not an important revision or it goes too far or it doesn't go far enough. But it is demonstrably a policy change. In the spring of 2022, they then wanted to define a new expert group who should look at the implementation of the new tests based on the design principles of the former proposal from the former advisory group. This is the group that had the last meeting last Friday. If you look at the structure of what we did here, it is, I'm not expecting you to understand all of it. I'm just suggesting the rough edges of, of this deliberative process. Up here, we have politicians in 2018, suggesting to the ministry how to define an advisory group. And we have the first advisory group here looking at evaluation questions. And this research center did an evaluation. So we looked at that, gave recommendations that I just told you about, sent them back and communicated. And then there was a policy change in 2021. Then there was Corona, some time passed. In the 2023, they defined a new implementation in terms of reference for a new group to look at the specificities of the implementation of the new system. They defined a new expert group. We produced recommendations with this last Friday, in the August 4, this summer. We will send them a nicely written and laid out report back to politicians, and it will go all the way out here. 
And then they will decide upon a new system and how it's implemented, and it will, will be implemented in 26, 27, the summer in between. So one more. Nine years would pass from the beginning of the first evaluation, thinking about the national tests, to an implementation of the new one. This is an incredibly long time and an, an, a strenuous, lengthy, complicated, not fun to be in process. In the expert group in 23, we have about 20 uh, recommendations that we agree on. We have 50 recommendations that only a majority supports. And we have about 10 that a minority only supports. Again, an, a, ridiculous, a ridiculously high number of recommendations as a result of my proposal that everybody could make recommendations and we could not and nobody could ask another member to withdraw his or her recommendation against this. So we have a polyphonous, more multifaceted, more participatory report with less bureaucratic language and less uniform articulations of recommendations, but with a broad set of views, not necessarily all consistent with each other, but nevertheless categorized into whether we support all support it, whether the majority supports it, or whether the minority is it. But of course, the different majorities in the group could also suggest recommendations that are slightly different or even go a little bit in different directions. So this is the kind of report that we produce. It is time that I land my presentation in about one or two slides. Why was this such a lengthy process and why was this so complicated? For a number of reasons. For example, the new tests are supposed to test only a few central skills, not all competences and skills in all subjects. Experts disagree about what are central skills, especially when it comes to reading. Different reading experts have different philosophies of the pedagogy of reading, so they have different interpretations theoretically of what the few central uh, few central skill in reading, which has an implication for the theoretical input that they give to psychometricians to assign the tests. So even well-trained experts may disagree. And we continue to debate what the few central skills, what they might be and what that means. Remember the disconnect came from the liberty. We have the tests, we have the discussion of the of what the few central uh, um, skills are, but these two are negotiated together. It's not that we first have one and then have the other. The text experience, the test experience for children has become a serious issue. We have children with different kinds of disabilities, different kinds of psychosocial sensibilities that we didn't have a few years ago, and whether or not they should be tested, under which circumstances, that should be tested, if they can be exempt from tests, if they cry during the test, etc., opens up a whole new solution. There is a huge big issue about psychometrics and precision. If we argue that precision is supposed to be the royal value among values in test models, then the psychometricians would have to say, yes, but then we also need to communicate about how precise are the tests. So we need to give significant levels and confidence intervals back to all families and then what the all teachers. So the implication is that we will have to teach 50,000 teachers in Denmark about statistical levels of significance and confidence intervals, and we would have to do the same with hundreds of thousands of families. Otherwise, the test results would be incomprehensible. That is how you communicate precision if you're a psychometrician. Some of us would argue, however, that the rest of the danger population are not psychometricians and they do not want to be psychometricians. So precision, if you really insist on precision, it has a heavy duty price to pay in terms of communication to all other people. Secondly, there is a strong philosophical difference between some of us and some of us. Some of us argue that precision is a precondition. Others, the camp to which I belong, say, there is a trade-off between precision. Very, very often in practical decision-making, we make decisions based on 
high degree of uncertainty and not precise information, but nevertheless, we're able to make good decisions. Decisions, the quality of decisions, that is not always inch on precise information. If we have time during the Q&A, I can give you a couple of examples. But there is a fundamental philosophical difference here between those who insist that precision is a precondition for good use, and another Campbell says philosophically, precision is important, but it's not like the royal, royal value of values. It's just one of the many things you can take into account in practical decision. And if you look at the practice of teaching, teachers in practice make many, many, many days today decisions based on different kinds of, of knowledge with different kinds of services and precision. The resource situation in school became that in a sense history, if you want to communicate the findings of national set back to families and, and parents, the ordinary teacher in Denmark has two by 15 minutes to communicate with them about everything that happens during a school year for one teacher. It has to do with do they thrive in the class or any particular problems, how are we doing in gymnastics, German geography, Danish, and how we'll be doing on the national test. And some teachers feel that the national test should not take up too much time among these two by 15 minutes that we have to communicate with the, teach with the parents, provided that the parents show up two times, 15 minutes on time, because that is the budget allow the teachers to communicate. Whereas evaluators would say, oh, you should have a long, open ended, learning oriented dialogue. But it has to take place during two or 15 minutes where lots of other topics are covered, and this is what teachers do. So that's an incentive. Another resource situation problem is that every third teacher in Denmark now who's being hired does not have an education background as a teacher. Because we do not educate enough young people who want to be teachers, because they see the school teacher job as low pay, unprestigious, not attractive, and many of them leave after five years. So we hire people who are not teachers, and we ask them to do the best they can. So they do not have the theoretical training in teaching and mathematics, geography, that would allow them to understand the theoretical underpinning of the results. So how do we communicate to them in a way that they understand and can transfer the meanings of the findings into the work of that's another resource. The technology in testing has, of course, been enabling as well as constraining, but it's a factor that is always with us because we still have to produce tests that can be uh, reproduced and managed in the whole country without interference of human beings and with self correct test results immediately, because otherwise we would have to hire people to correct all these, find these test results from more than 100,000 students, which we will not do. The definition of expertise was a constant, constant um, challenge. During the whole process, we had members of the group who very, very openly challenged the expertise of other members in the group, which for some made the um, deliberation interesting, but not comfortable. In particular, there was a tension between those who were used to the discourse from universities where you can strongly criticize people in a way that when regular normal teachers sit in the same room they feel the atmosphere and the form of debate as extremely uncomfortable so that was another thing to take into account in the attempts to create a deliberative participatory uh, atmosphere finally what do i take with me and my thoughts because in the deliberation in the group there is a high degree of controversy about what it means to be an expert, what, who has the right to speak as an expert, to which extent do we recognize the expertise of other so-called experts? Are you an expert if you are a teacher who have been teaching for many years in a particular discipline? Are you then an expert? Not an easy thing to deal with in practice. There are many, many kinds of engagements, also new ones. The psychosocial or experiences of children taking the test have been a very important issue which it wasn't really uh, 
and whether local managers and schools will emphasize the test results as a key performance indicator in their municipality or not is still up for discussion, regardless of whether we have national tests. The technical practical distinction was renegotiated in many different ways. Uh, I have given examples regarding the uh, adaptive linear discussion and also this whole discussion about the, the argument of precision and how it relates to practical use. This is very complex. And if you're an expert, you tend to assume that the way that you link one issue to another one, for instance, precision to use, is the same that other people link precision with use, which it is not. Which is why, as a chairperson of the group, I did not accept any previous linking of the debate. I said, we do not first discuss precision and then use. I will accept the linking that some experts made at the expense of the use of other experts. I will simply say, everybody can make a recommendation. Then we can discuss the recommendations. Leading, of course, to some complex interaction between the different the different uh, uh, recommendations made. But I insisted not to have a previously generally accepted linkages of each of issues before the discussion starts, because then I would accept the linkages made by one expert rather than not. So I was quite quite clear about that leading to what many people experience as a relatively muddy discussion along the way. But here is a way in which the social relations between experts and the structure of the argument are again in connection with each other, if we want them to. Okay. It was, it took a lot of time, nine years, a lot of resources, a lot of energy. My beloved wife said, Peter, when you're in this group, you're not yourself. <laughs> and she was right. So I don't recommend anybody to engage in that kind of work just for fun, because it's not fun. It's meaningful, but not fun. It was a lengthy deliberation up to the political decision. And it was a lengthy discussion afterwards and a lengthy implementation. So, yes, we can change evaluation systems, but we should be prepared that it will take a long, long time and a lot of energy. And here is the tragical paradox that we don't have the time and means to do this with all the evaluation systems that we have at this point. Probably we simply have a discrepancy between how large these systems are and the time and energy we have to carry out the liberations. Nevertheless, at least to do it on an exemplary basis is an important one, I think, because it allows us also to read and critically and skeptically the evaluation imaginaries that we invest in these systems. And we have to critically rethink the way that evaluators in generations before us invested their imaginaries in the evaluation systems that we are now struggling with in our content society. Thank you for your attention. Um, thank you very much, Professor. Um, I'm aware that we have uh, overrun our time, so those who need to leave now, uh, you can you can do so. Uh, but uh, if, if it's possible, I'd like to just take a few questions. Uh, I'm, I'm sure there are some immediate responses to, to that, uh, frankly, uh, incredible talk. So I'll just take a few questions uh, from anyone on the floor. Harry, please go ahead. Thank you very much. That was very, very insightful. Uh, I was wondering whether you make any difference between uh, ex and ex post evaluation, or whether you think that uh, these two evaluation systems should be uh, assessed in a kind of different way. And uh, what is your comment about uh, using uh, lottery systems or jury based uh, systems into uh, evaluating the evaluating systems in, in that sense? Like, uh, instead of only uh, using uh, experts, only experts discussing about uh, evaluating the problem, this goes back to the uh, democratization for the before uh, and asking from people like in the general community, it can be satisfied or not, it can be like people that are like 
teachers or they have taught before or things like that. But what do you think about these other courses? Okay, thanks. Um, in terms of the ex ante and ex so I, I do think that there are some who think of the ex ante evaluation too much as a uh, desk exercise. I think that some of the earlier lessons we learned from evaluability assessment should be reinvented and used again when we are designing evaluation systems. I think there is an important lesson there that is not being remembered enough. We could be more diligent when we design also ex ante evaluations using evaluability assessment to inform us. And we could also be more clever in piloting small scale evaluations to test the practical implications before we use them in large scale in ex ante evaluation systems. Then again, in the very, very long run, I do think that the distinction between ex ante and ex post runs the risk of being broken down exactly as the distinction between summative and formative. Because once you have these ongoing, very complex emerging systems, then there will be an example before the exposed and an exposed before the example, and they both build on each other, and you can't figure out what the intentions were like 50 rounds ago. So, over time, the distinction between the two, I think, is going to collapse. But so insofar as we can use the concepts, I do think that more can be done to empirically test example uh, feasibility, etc. Secondly, Involving non-experts in these processes, I think, could be done for two very different reasons. They're overlapping, but not the same. One reason is that we normatively think it's good for democracy to involve more people. Another thing is that we want the kind of feedback that different people can give us, also in the capacity of being users and victims and managers of evaluation systems. And we need that kind of feedback because the architects of evaluation systems are becoming increasingly blind because they are so far away. They live in different offices in different countries and are not in eye to eye contact with people who experience the daily life of living with evaluation systems. I tend to support the latter argument a little bit more than the former argument. I tend to look at the importance of having different kinds of feedback. And here you could make a parallel to those who are interested in complexity theory and the notion of having complex feedback is the system so that those who design the systems are not blind to them to be effective. So, but it's, as I hope my case study has revealed, it's, it's really, really complicated to design these processes and to create a form of communication that where people are feel happy and where we spend resources reasonably. Well, it's, it's, it's extremely complicated, and I think that one of the paradoxes of the skeptical turn in evaluation is that we can see the problems with evaluation systems, but we haven't invented the social technologies that can fix these problems. I think there is an interesting paradox. I'll take one last question, um, lady at the back. So um, thank you for your really amazing and vivid presentation, and uh, really informative. And I have lots of questions, sorry. So you mentioned about the I mean, key message you mentioned about stakeholder in, in, in engagement. I'm really definitely agree with you that the direct democracy is necessary. But it also requires the education level of the citizen, the participants. So some of the representatives, if you want to choose them, you need to be careful. They are they are well known in this education area. And and also, you mentioned about the cost and time. And um, do you think this kind of method, because it's, it's a long term change, so it probably depends on our cost and time. And the, the methodology MCPA, what do you think about it? Is it a similar concept? And um, for, for example, if you are a decision maker, you, you have Ministry of Health, Ministry of Education, you have Ministry of Different Things, and some of them. Maybe they, they focus on short term things, for example, over the job for children or the health education. So there are different kinds of skills. And in the decision maker, how can you deliver the message to them like medicine and education? Because it's a whole concept 
on the other project. And I know so the other one I'm curious, what do you think about the IQ test rate range? Because this could be related to some of the, the global IQ test ranking. Because some of the, the, the countries that compare the IQ test ranking across the country. And for example, Finland has been a high ranking country. And so what do you think about that? Is it linking to your evaluation as well? And also you mentioned about the teaching qualification in Denmark. Some people think teacher is a local job or it's something that you mentioned. And what do you think it can be the change for example like Finland if teacher qualifications to be advanced or above and then with a high pay? Do you think that will change the situation right now? And also, you also talk about the, the, the learning thing. For example, now we live in the AI world. So the learning pattern has changed. I think there's a massive information area. So this national test, do you, does, does that work? And how can we adopt it for, for AI thing nowadays? Because people learn not from the textbook, they learn from the, they watch, they learn everything from the, you don't use like the wording and or you you learn something from the image. So how can this uh, learning pattern or the national test about the future work? And can you recommend or advise this? Yes, that's a lot of questions. Thank you very much. I'm sure you will forgive if <laughs> okay because all of we have we have more time to yeah. but in the interest of time let me add we respond to a small part of your question. Yeah, sorry. With full respect for the relevance of the other part. Okay. Now, the question about cost and time. One thing that characterizes the social privilege is that you have the time that you allow yourself to set certain time aside for things that you prioritize. So the ability of different stakeholders to set time to set aside time for this process is very, very different. Which means that you cannot say, as some people in deliberations, oh, we should just have more time. No, because in practice, people have different kinds of time. Teachers who spend five days away from their work to engage in this group have sacrificed a lot in their life. But a university professor spending five days when he has committed his life to the critique of national success, that's just nothing. He wanted to have 50 more days because he has to go his whole life to the critique of national success. So we are. I to differentiate the social in terms of how we can commit time to the liberal processes, which is why I do not necessarily think it's a bad thing that we set aside 30 hours to discuss this and stop the discussion and deliver whatever we can back to the democratic system. So that's one thing. One other complication is that as different stakeholders participate in this debate, I also notice that part of their perspective, part of their relevant structure, comes from the role that they play in relation to existing performance metrics and non systems. So school teachers have to defend the evaluability of the school vis-a-vis -vis the municipal leadership. The teachers are thinking ahead, what position will I put myself in if the test are designed in this way, et cetera, et cetera. So that the inputs they give are not from just, let's say, Pure human beings created by God or something like that in an open deliberative process. No participants participate in that process given the way that they perceive their role in relation to existing performance management evaluation systems, which adds another complication to the considerable effect because people are also defending their evaluative reputation, which also means that evaluators have to think fairly clever. Because they are also producing relevant structure for the next generation of managers and teachers and pupils and citizens. Okay. So, in a sense, we are more complexly involved in something that is a lot bigger than our class when we decide. I have said more than enough. I have that was great. Thank you so much, Ebata. Thank you. Thank you.